Hello everybody and welcome to this month's practice groups. Good afternoon everyone. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, goofy stuff that sometimes people put in specs. Sometimes it's word choice, sometimes it's uh, syntax, uh, assemblages of, of paragraph or uh, clauses and phrases and so forth. Um, talk about uh, lengthy sentences that drift off into gobbledygook that nobody can understand much. And uh, we're hoping to have some fun with this. Um, for several years when I was in Memphis, I had a monthly column in our newsletter down there called Spec Boners that uh, I would find <coughs> real life examples from specifications that cross my desk one way or another or that people, uh, my readers, uh, would send in and uh, would make snarky remarks about them and skewer them a little bit, but use them, I hope, as uh, as uh, teaching opportunities to uh, encourage us to do the right thing. So uh, with that in mind, our goal here today is not to just rehash the CDT training on some of the streamlining language and so forth, but to try to look at things in a little more uh, larger viewpoint. So this is uh, David wanted to start off with this quote. You know, um, I tell people that if you ever have to get into, if you ever have to go into court no matter what the AIA conditions say about drawings and specifications being of equal uh, precedence, that neither takes precedence over the other, but they are complementary, uh, will not in practice uh, work. Uh, the judge, the jury, and the lawyers are all going to look at the specifications first, and if there's a a problem, that's what they're going to take if there's a discrepancy between the drawings and specs. And it's hard for me to say this with a, a straight face, but the folks outside our business actually believe, I'm really having trouble controlling my laughter, that architects and engineers spend more time on the written word than they do and more effort than they do on drawing. So, well. Uh, Brevity is not only the soul of wit, it's the soul of specifications. And uh, here's a little uh, picture for your uh, uh, inspiration of a great man who made a lot of money by saying, yep, nope, and not much more than that. <laughs> the book's trunken. Uh, Elements of Style by Strunk and White is one of my favorite uh, guides to writing clear language. And it contains one, to me, what is the, one of the most beautiful and elegant words and uh, sentences in the English language. Right up there with it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. And that sentence is, omit needless words. And uh, that's good advice. Uh, also, back in the 70s, I read a book on writing that suggested that when you do your first draft to go through and just arbitrarily almost knock out every third or fourth word, uh, especially uh, uh, adverbs and when you can live without definite articles, the, this, that, and indefinite articles, a and an, and it makes your prose a little more muscular. Well, in our case, what we want to do is reduce our specification language to the most elemental level to make it easy to read. The Medcalf theory of communication is that the shorter the communication is, the more likely it is to be correct, the more likely it is to be understood, and the more likely it is to be compliant with. Um, I'm sorry that David is not on because this is something that uh, that he put into the presentation. So I'll have 
try to rep to represent his interests in this thing. What he's talking about here is this is a typical paragraph from Master Spec. And uh, you know, here in the sweet sunny south, although I'm not a southerner by uh, birth, um, I have learned that you can say the most devastating things about people if you preface it with bless their hearts. So bless their hearts, ARCOM seems to go out of their way to make convoluted text. Is it a closed spec or is it proprietary? Is it uh, open? And there are some code words that are tied into division one, but there are ways to simplify this. What do we actually need to say to accomplish what we need? And uh, David asked the question, must every paragraph start with the, the same phrase? And of course, there's the, uh, the, uh, the whole principle of division one is to be able to collect all of what um, my good friend Craig Haney, uh, independent specifier from the Dallas area, used to call the apple pie and mom statements. Hang it straight, screw it tight beat to fit, paint to match, and comply with the manufacturer's instructions. Now why we have to say that over and over and over is beyond me. We can say that once and, uh, and rely on the division one to govern all of the other specification sections. And in fact, if you ever had a dispute, does anyone really think that we want the contractor to depart from what the manuf from the instructions that come in the manufacturer's box or uh, written on the side of the, uh, the tube of sealant. But here's a way that um, uh, David suggests of greatly reducing the number of words, You're getting down from 23 words to six or seven, and simplifying things and relying on what we put in Division 1 so that we explain what is a comparable product. Is it permitted? Is it not permitted? That's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Substitutions. Of course, a comparable product is the difference between those two is that a comparable product is one that might be uh, uh, sent in as part of a normal Submittal, and um, Lewis. If it's reasonably yes, ah, are you with us, David? Sort of. Okay. Sort of. This is right. an interesting experience. <laughs> oh yes. Well, I'll let you do some of my part of the presentation later, just to even things out. Why don't you go ahead and finish this uh, very excellent uh, uh, suggestion for simplifying? Uh, the products and manufacturers paragraphs. Well, I'm probably going to trip over everything that you've already said because I haven't been on audio or visual, and I've uh, you know this is uh, interesting anyhow. So if I start down the same path, please tell me. Okay, we'll do. All right. So the 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 paragraph that Lewis showed you just a couple minutes ago is probably one of my favorite from Master Spec to try to explain brevity because I think that what they've done is they've tried to uh, take the tack that if you're not saying the text in the individual technical sections, even though you have Division One to try to help yourself along, that nobody is going to bother to go back and read Division One, so they have to say it all again. And my tack on this is to reduce that entire paragraph down to really three words. It just says products and manufacturers, and then list the products and manufacturers. And you, relying on past respect for uh, the Division I concepts, the other two things are the comparable products and substitutions. Um, I did and explain that. Are, Kind of the difference between those two concepts is uh, okay, yeah, because they're not in, um, the same. Master Spec Division One, right? The thing, they're not the same. One and, of the things and, that um, that bless their hearts, Arcom uh, 
seems to prefer is they like dense multi-sentence paragraphs where as I would think that the contractor who has to read this turgid prose would really prefer these simple, almost bullet form sort of uh, paragraphs and subparagraphs with uh, numbered lists. Right. And the one thing that I do try to do in our own is just list the products and manufacturers and then actually have a, a direct statement, comparable products. Are they permitted or not permitted? And if that's you pretty really straightforward. Want to get terse, yeah, if you really want to get terse, that's all you have to say. If you want to be helpful, you could point them back to the, the Division One section where the th uh, comparable products are defined. But you have to be careful, too, because by Division One, by default, if you list a basis of design manufacturer, comparable products are not permitted. You have to list the basis of design and list other manufacturers at, as a minimum because the contractor is required to pick only from the listed manufacturers. So with, with the simplification here, I'm saying that you can go from a minimum of nine words with master spec out of the box or 25 words if you're allowing for comparable products down to six or seven and be done. And I will tell you that when I have manufacturers coming in to visit and asking about trying to get into specifications and how they deal with substitutions, I tell them in master spec, if they can recognize the, spec, the spec's origin, if they look for that word available in the products and manufacturers listing, that opens the door. Yes. If, if the architect is following master spec convention, all they have to do is find the word available. Um, for the, some of our uh, listeners, David, who are not master spec subscribers, would you uh, explain w w the significance of that phrase and how it's used well, in master spec? Yeah. When if you read the master spec division one, available means that they've it's a non-restricted or an open spec that the contractor has the option of submitting comparable products, not substitutions, but comparable products. And the rigor of the submission is not as great when you go the comparable products route. So there, there's some significant impact as to whether or not that word available is there and opening up that spec to comparable products. So it's important uh, to understand what these words mean and, and how the entire spec comes together. And I think when we reduce it to this simplified version, it's much easier to understand. Yes. Kevin O'Byrne uh, asked was kind of asking about the difference about basis of design and comparable products and we might say that the, by naming a basis of design it's a short way of saying this is what we want and if you've got something that's essentially the same and it's an equivalent product and if comparable products are are permitted then you can um, provide it by from another manufacturer Right, right, but be careful, as I said in master spec, if you list basis of design, by division one definition, it closes the spec. There are no comparable products. Yes. All right. Shall we go on? Let's see. Sure. Here we go. Your envelope consultant. Yeah, I, I like to pick on some of these specifications that we get. And this is one that came right from an envelope consultant uh, about his seal and adhesion test. And, and if you read through this, he goes on, he talks about the initial test and talks about um, failures uh, in that test and then what has to be done for testing afterwards. But what if that first test fails? 
there's no indication of what happens when that first test fails. But he has a lot of words here trying to explain how to do the testing and how to do additional testing. Uh, in the last paragraph, additional testing and replacement, a non-conforming sealant, no cost to the owner. But what does that mean? It doesn't explain it anywhere. So even though we're talking a little bit here about brevity and, and trying to make things clear, brevity is not always the absolute best solution, because I did suggest a rewrite for this, and Lewis, if you want to go to the next oh, one. Okay. Yes, Since because you're in the driver's seat here. <laughs> one of the four, and of course, one of the four C's is complete. And so, if it's incomplete, right. even if it's brief and and understandable, and ain't uh, ain't what we need it to, won't do what we want it to do. Right. So here is is a rewrite, and you can see what happened is in a, in effect, I've just identified an initial test and then subsequent test, but also went into what happens with those tested joints fail in paragraph B. You know, so now they've got to go back and do additional testing to prove that what they've got in place is actually going to work. And until they do uh, finish that, that uh, there really is no assurance for the owner or the architect that everything is actually working as it should. So in this case here, I said, it's more words, but I think we have the intent better defined, and that really is... Lewis says it has to be complete. It has to be understandable. I want to pick up a couple of uh, questions and comments. Uh, Kevin O'Baron, harking back to the previous slide, uh, talks about, of course, working with public agencies. Many of them have very strict rules about naming names and uh, listing manufacturer and specific products. So that's always an issue. And then uh, Michael McVitie, uh, says, given your references to Master Spec's obesity, <laughs> I like that, what would you commend, recommend as a clear, concise alternative guide specification? Oh, I could do, I could say that. Yeah, you can, because CSI owns it, right? <laughs> well, we could do that. I mean, there's, there's BSD spec link, certainly that's an option. And the text in Speclink is uh, much shorter, more to the point. And then the other option, and I'll, I'll tell you, there's the disclaimer, because I wrote it for 15 years, is Spectext. Uh, that Spectext and Speclink are probably much more closely aligned and much uh, less wordy than Master Spec. So there are two options. Um, I, except I think Arcom bought Spectex a couple of years ago, and they're rebranding it. They, I'm not sure that they, that it's available for the regular building. I think they're rebranding it more for the uh, infrastructure uh, engineering it, projects. That's my impression, but it's it still does cover, cover most of the architectural. So I think, for the, at least for the time being, you could probably still use it for both. Oh, okay. Joseph Anatrella says that, says that it is. That is the case. I haven't looked into it for a while. Um, Troy Stieg says, where 1,000 feet is listed, is the comma in the 1,000 kept out on purpose? <laughs> Good eye, Troy. And welcome to the practice group. Well, you know Troy's uh, a specifier, don't you? Yeah, yes. Well, he's, I know he's an architect. I don't know if he's actually writing specs. He and I <laughs> had a chat last week uh, about PPDs, but um, okay. I can't say that it was on purpose. <laughs> Maybe right. I'm need taking to, a lesson from metric. We kind of need to move on uh, a little bit. And this is another one of your examples that leads us into the gobbledygook department. Yep, and this one, uh, the lead-in, I mean, this is a very last paragraph in of six, trying to describe what has to be done to delegate design to a contractor, and this happened to be for an envelope. Uh, this was actually something that Bruno Caterini had shared with me uh, to uh, just in the in way of discussion. But you can notice here from the highlighted text 
near the end of the, of the paragraph that, in effect, it's saying, and you want to go ahead down to the next one, Lewis? Sure. If you take a quick read of that, <laughs> here's the translation. Sign the contract, submit the drawings, and then we'll talk about the rules. Harking so, back to the uh, master, master builder days. Yeah, and it's and this is one that you get through all of the words that are there when you finally decipher everything that you can really boil it down to these three things. And if you if you do look at that, you see instantly that it's really completely unfair to the contractor and trying to uh, give the architect the total power to say afterwards that he can decide anything that he wants is is uh, really unfair and we ought to be a little bit more careful than that and we shouldn't have to take six paragraphs to say this <laughs> definitely this is uh, an example from a uh, specification on remediation and demolition and uh, you know, I've been writing specs since about 1976, and I'm really not completely sure what this thing says. There is a rule of thumb for optimum sentence length, and that is 26 words. It's easy to remember since there are 26 letters in the English la language. Oh, you might find some experts differ a little bit, but that's generally the, the length in which you can hold the whole sense in your mind at one time and comprehend it as a coherent whole. Now, it's not to say that uh, on some documents, if you have uh, semicolons, that you can have a bunch of independent clauses that you can read each one. But in general, uh, we ought to stick to that. And I've got some really great examples. These are all real, coming up. real examples. This is from um, a section on uh, final cleaning uh, from about 1999 and um, it says uh, thorough cleaning um, throughout by the contractor and of course we want to say who else and that first sentence is 64 words long so it's, that would be very difficult to to read and to uh, to understand especially if you get into a dispute and you have to explain this thing. Um, well, this and just, just as an aside there, Lewis, you know, that, that's why CSI promotes this outline structure in absolutely. specification. Gosh, and you know, you can do a heading or a, or a main thought and then put this, all of the subservient kinds of thoughts as subparagraphs under it, and the meaning becomes much more clear, I believe. Yes, as opposed to the uh, narrative over the river and through the woods approach. And by the way, uh, to give a little foreshadow of next month, we're going to talk, be talking next month about specifications then and now. And I have some paragraphs from a uh, architect's uh, textbook in, published in 1947 that... Um, have all of this stuff about uh, streamlined language and and uh, you know quick um, short bullet lists and short choppy sentences and so forth and it's fascinating we're going to share that with you next next week as we or next month as we talk about the history of specifications and how we got to where we are now and this is uh, my favorite, and I, I'm, I'm going to read this one out loud just because I have to. As a condition precedent to, and as an additional consideration for the award of any contract or subcontract pursuant to these specifications, the contractor and all subcontractors, suppliers, engineers, and other parties to the performance of the work required by these specifications do agree that in the event any party institutes a suit against any party because of any alleged failure performed properly hereunder, or any alleged error, or omission, breach of warranty, negligence, or mere malpractice hereunder, and if if such suit is not successfully prosecuted to a judgment in favor of the party plaintiff, or if it is dismissed, or if a judgment is rendered for any defendant or defendants 
The party instituting the suit hereby agrees to pay in full all actual costs of defense, including but not limited to attorney fees, expert witness fees, costs of investigations in preparation for trial, professional time expended by principals and employees of the prevailing party, and that same shall be taxed as cost in said action and judgment entered thereon. Go ye and do likewise. <laughs> well, now, Lewis, where in the world in the contract did this thing appear? Actually, that was it's, in the in the, the uh, owner's general conditions. It was technically it, it was not the, a specification. Uh, yeah, well, thankfully it wasn't in the waterproofing section. I could just picture <laughs> this. No, but we've all seen things like that. But you know, the thoughts of somebody having something like that in a written contract just even if the content was correct this needs a major overhaul to make it readable and can you imagine trying to explain th this dog to a judge and jury and as to the correctness even the correctness of the content there are really only two parties to a construction contract the owner and the contractor so even from a technical legal aspect it's it's got some some errors Shall we guess what kind of a, a trade wrote this paragraph? <laughs> well, Joseph Anatrella says, ask, was it written by lawyers? And yes, it was. It, was, or, <laughs> it had to have been. <laughs> and I would say a cut-rate lawyer, not a good one. <laughs> Here's, this one's one of yours. This is the Hidden Gems Department. Oh, yeah. And this, this one, I, I happen to be reviewing... The, the section, uh, in this case, it was um, written by the food service consultant. Food service consultant. Now, what made this thing catch my attention? When you, when you scan through the document and you see references to AIA documents in a technical section, that got my attention. Uh, yes, so, that's <laughs> usually a no-no. So, yeah, so here we are, the food service consultant referencing A201, the general conditions, and in the technical section requiring that the contract comply to A201. Now, he has no idea, does he? Go to, go to the <laughs> next one here, Lewis. I mean, this is, this is, in effect, the food service consultant assigning the general conditions of the contract. It's, I mean, this is absolutely amazing. <laughs> but hey, at one least is, he did get the current issue. One is tempted to say solipsistic. <laughs> so, we, I mean, we need to be careful of this kind of stuff. And this is, uh, while it's, it's not really about brevity, it's not really about... Um, making the thing understandable, but it's really about watching and coordinating what's going on in the specification, because these kinds of things creep in so easily, If and it, because we have so many players in the construction contract anymore, uh, reading every last line and understanding that all of it is correct is almost an impossible task. Uh, yes, and, and um, uh, we have a couple comments from the, the floor. Um, Paul Gerber points out that some building codes are no better than this uh, lengthy 169-word sentence. And yes, they they could sure uh, use some rewriting some of the paragraphs. Or you, we sit around and puzzle and say, oh, "What does that mean?" Uh, Kevin O'Byrne points out it's that a, a document is not a contract document unless specifically so listed in the owner contract agreement. And uh, Michael observes that Michael McVitie observes that obscure language by one lawyer often leads to the need to hire on one of their friends. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there is a Michael. problem. There is a problem Michael, with. Michael, yes, really cynical, but that's <laughs> probably true. <laughs> there is a problem with what I would call the uh, stream of consciousness form of writing, and. Uh, I have seen, uh, unfortunately I don't, was not able to locate an, an actual example, but I've seen some mechanical specifications where you had seven subordinate levels of sub 
and sub sub and sub 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 paragraphs down to seven levels just because as he was thinking he just kept thinking oh well that's a subset of that oh that's a subset of that and it was just a kind of a stream of consciousness thing and the other uh, issue that we're going to talk about as we go through this presentation is you have to read people what you write. <laughs> go back and read it. Does it make sense? Is it correct? Carefully consider what you've written. <laughs> yes. And, you know, stand in the contractor's shoe or in the supplier's shoes and, and step back and read it and say, is it understandable? Right. And is it fair? Does it meet the golden rule? <laughs> Would you like to have that in your contract? Yeah, this, this is another one of my favorites. Again, from the food service consultant. Oh, yes. They, they tend to be very um, solipsistic and self-centered. <laughs> yeah, so, if, so order of precedence by CSI is not a particularly good thing, but when it's buried in a technical document, where you're not likely to find it, and all of a sudden you find out food service documents govern, and that column supporting the building tower above is now in the wrong place, who's going to negotiate that one? <laughs> That's right. If anybody's going to move columns, it's going to be me, the architect, right? Yeah, we'll just put them on wheels and push them out of the way, that's all. <laughs> I think that, that could work. That could work. And then we have the Bureau of Redundancy Department. Um, this first, first example, of course, is uh, from a Division I requirements of a client for a hotel project. And... Uh, if, if you, you don't need to use minimum and at least in the same sentence. But my favorite one is this next one. That's a real good one. Roof rafters at two feet on center, maximum, typical, except as noted below unless shown otherwise. Was that a structural note? Yes, it was in the uh, structural engineer's general notes, which on the sheet that nobody reads? Well, this old boy usually does. <laughs> because, and if you think about it, you, I'm sure the engineer might not think about it this way, but those general notes are specifications. They just happen to be written on the, on the drawing sheet instead of bound into the project manual. And um, I do a lot of for the audience's uh, knowledge, I do a lot of quality reviews and peer reviews. And one of the things that we find all the time is that uh, structural engineers, because they have elaborate notes on their drawings, will often write things that directly contradict what they put in their specifications. And presumably the structural notes on the drawings are mostly uh, standard boilerplate language, whereas somebody else edits the uh, spec uh, sections to try to make them more project specific. Uh, but not that our mechanical, electrical, and plumbing friends don't uh, occasionally do that too. Yeah, it's it's not just limited to structural. That's for sure. We see it um, happen even on architectural. We end up with some general notes, usually on the code review sheet or on a on the sheet filled with abbreviations that don't match the rest of the drawings. And on civil, they usually have pages of notes, too. So you, you need to be careful of all of it. I will also say that going back to this, uh, this note, that the phrase, unless shown otherwise, or unless otherwise indicated, or unless otherwise noted, are not contractor favorite language. They do not like to see that. Well, it, tur it turns it into a, um, a hide and seek game. A hide and seek is exactly the right phrase. Yeah, you know, because, gosh, you know, how far do you go to try to find 
those otherwise things that might be buried somewhere. David Trudell has an excellent question for you, David. He asks, really? what is the typical response from a client when you bring bogus notes to their attention? Oh, interesting. <laughs> I told you it was a good question. <laughs> I'll you, well, I, this goes back to your QA uh, comments, Lewis. And I will tell, we do the same thing. We, we provide QA services. And every time I do a QA review, especially for a new client, first time we've ever done it, when I go in to present that, the results, it is with a lot of trepidation because I have no idea what the reaction is going to be. Because in essence, you're telling them, look, here's the set of drawings, here's all the markups on the drawings and the specifications, and you need to fix this stuff. Now, we're doing it, trying to do it very matter matter of factly it's not accusing anybody of doing something wrong but it needs to be fixed but the reaction that you get is anywhere from downright hostile to very appreciative and it really depends upon the team and the attitude of the lead person uh, or the lead design person on the team in the late 1980s, David, when I was started doing this for my previous firm, um, after the first couple, I hit on the idea of doing all of my markups with green pencil rather than red. And this seemed to go down better. <laughs> Just a simple little psychological thing. Okay. Well, that, that, that's something to consider. It's less because they are, Is that what you're telling me? Well, for one thing, it's it's more advisory, you know, and, and I phrase a lot of my notes in the form of questions. Did you really mean to do this? <laughs> but uh, also, um, they're not, also, I don't want people to think these are red lines. They, they, I, I may call something to someone's attention because I think it needs to be thought about, but the PM may, or the PA may have a very good reason for doing it the way it is, and I don't want the, you know, them handing off my sheets to the uh, drafter or the junior staff to just do everything I say. Ah, I don't want okay. that responsibility. But here's your translation of that previous uh, bit of gobbledygook, which I think was brilliant. Oh, your translation, that is, not the uh, bad example. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, just make sure that you do all of the homework for the engineer, That and that would be appropriate. You know, if you're going to list every imaginable standard by broad reference uh, to NFPA or ASTM, uh, that's exactly what you're doing, and, and in effect, by by using that really broad reference like that, it's completely unenforceable. Yes, a lot of folks don't really uh, know that um, uh, the references article really doesn't tell a contractor to do anything. It's merely a formalized statement of the long full title of uh, documents that are referred to by short uh, abbreviations and designations in the text uh, of the rest of the specifications. Um, Paul Gerber has a question, is there a loose accordance? That's yet another redundancy. <laughs> somewhat in accordance? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> as opposed to strict accordance, huh? Oh, I love that strict accordance. You know, that actually, don't ever write that, folks, because that works against you. Because what the what a lawyer will say is, oh, if you want strict compliance, that means you, during CA, are going to spend more time looking at that and reading the installation instructions than you are for other normal uh, stuff. And if there's a problem with the waterproofing and you've written strict compliance, you're probably going to get to share in the in the uh, recovery. Uh, sort of here's like the, including all yeah. in selected instances. Yes, and not everywhere else. Yes. Yes. Okay. 
this is the failure to proofread read department that we alluded to earlier. I like this one. This is from a, an actual spec from uh, for stone pavers, uh, written by a landscape architect. And you notice the allowable tolerance there, variation from plum. And uh, I don't know about you, but I have trouble walking on plum surfaces. <laughs> Very sticky soles on your shoes. That's all. And this is this is one of my real favorites from uh, a uh, from somebody that they want uh, tempered hardboard, a a, a, a masonite, uh, to be to these dimensions between 47.999 and 48.001. So that's a tolerance of two thousandths of an inch. The, a typical piece of typing paper is three to three and a half thousandths of an inch. And I want to know how this guy is going to measure that in the field. You know, they have a very large micrometer. <laughs> so this this one is clear, it's concise, and it's complete, but it ain't correct. <laughs> oh, gosh. I, I, how could they even, in right conscious, write something like that? Honest to gosh. I mean, construction in the field, if I can get it within a half an inch, I'm happy. <laughs> Indeed. Um, and that's, a, that's something that... Uh, Again, we sometimes have to explain to our younger staff that what we draw as straight lines ain't necessarily straight when they get built. And we have to allow for some ins and outs of those slab edges and even some ups and downs. A um, couple of comments. Um, Joseph Anatrella said, well, maybe there's stone pavers installed on the walls. Uh, Clifford Marvin suggests it's the Batman tolerance. I like that. Uh, <laughs> Steve Roth does point out that, yes, if the pavers have square edges, if the edges are installed plumb, they will be level. Um, and Alan points out that he likes the date on the ANSI standard and and the requirement for surface 1S, S1S. And you notice the, the date there. We're going to talk about that. We've got another example of that one. Yeah, you know, only specifiers really could come up with these kinds of responses. Like. And, and yes, yeah, here's... <laughs> Here's the example. This is a specification that was written in uh, 19, uh, uh, let's see, 1999. Right down yeah. there in the bottom corner. That's right. Well, I'm, ch I'm looking at my, checking my notes here just to make sure. And um, what's at issue, of course, is the ASTM, ANSI, and other standards generating organizations have regular update cycles. And so for most ASTM standards, they're updated, what, every three, four, five years? Five standards? years. Five years. Five years max. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes more often if, you know, the industry, if, the, if something changes in the industry. Um, and ANSI has similar rules about how often those standards have to be updated. And so this is a clear sign that <clears throat> when you cite standards that are 20 or 30 years old, that uh, you're just picking stuff up from somebody else. Uh, well, like Mary Noe. Huh? If, you, if you look at your paragraph on uh, load-bearing CMU, yes. grade N1, that was deleted probably yes. in the 90s, the grade yeah. requirement. Doesn't even exist anymore. Right. Exactly. Yeah, Mary Noe says, written in 1981, copied into another spec in 1999, and probably recopied last year. <laughs> oh, well. Uh, and Clifford points out that after 10 years, if a, uh, an ASTM is automatically withdrawn, if not revised. So, yeah. And, of course, is there a need, David, to cite specific dates? for uh, such uh, standards? Well, I never do. And the, the rationale is that I go back to Division One and I say that the, 
the referenced standards are always the ones in effect as of the date of the documents unless a specific version is required by code. Yes, which does happen sometimes. Right. So again, Division 1 can greatly simplify and shorten all of our specs and relieves us of the duty of having to look up those ASDMs and make sure that we've got the right date. Uh, here's an example uh, from um, that's obviously copying from a manufacturer spec. And one of the interesting kind of formalistic things on this one, David, is that it was not a paragraph. It was actually 3.1. So it was at the article level. So not only is it long and confusing, confusing, but here our spe our intrepid specifier is trying to control what the manufacturer does. And I liked your comment on that. Well, hey, yeah. If we're going to require that they have a national network for maintaining their product, we should be able to demand where the technician comes from, don't you think? Absolutely. Absolutely. And be available 24-7. Yep. <laughs> uh, and we, of course, we need to work on industry term, standard terminology. Uh, oh, a you've opened up a Pandora's box <laughs> with this one. You know that. There is a difference between millwork and architectural woodwork. Millwork is the stuff you buy at the lumber yard, and is governed by the National Association of Will of Millwork Manufacturers. Um, one of my favorites is to is to uh, tell interior designers, especially the younger ones, that tegular, if you use the word tegular on the drawings, that might exclude USG. I just love it when they talk to the USG ceiling rep and ask them, do they have that uh, pattern with a tegular edge? I'm not sure why that word is so popular, because to me it's an ugly word. but. And then a, a lot of people, or a lot of younger folks, actually think that brake metal is a different kind of metal. That they don't know what it is, you know. They don't think it's aluminum or steel or anything. They just, and they spell it B-R-E-A-K, -E whereas uh, David and I went to high school at a time when, or junior high, when uh, we were required to take a uh, metal shop as part of our um, rounding out the background of our uh, education. And so we know that it's brick formed with a B-R-A-K-E. Uh, Joseph Anna Trello says, oh, yeah, brick metal. That's the metal that breaks, yeah. Yeah, like Zamax. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> like Zamax, yes. Uh, Steve, Steve Groth says one of my favorite Miss terminology uses is he once saw on a set of drawings a note for a trash shoot spelled S H O O T. Uh, that's only, I think that even surpasses, uh, I saw some drawings where the mounting height was spelled M O U N T A I N. Uh, Paul Gerber asks. <laughs> Well, it's, you know, that's the Yankee pronunciation, mounting. Oh, I see. Uh, Paul Gerber asks, perhaps brake metal is, um, is a metal for uh, brake dancing floors. Oh, there's a possibility. Well, and just staying on that subject for just a, one more comment. You know, the Building Smart is actually trying to develop a data dictionary and, in effect, a thesaurus to try to sort this all out for electronic communications because the, the terminology differences are regional, uh, by country, by any other number of different things, and the number of different terms used, just think about it, for gyp board, gypsum board, gyp board, drywall, uh, wall board, you know, and the list goes on and on, I'm trying to reconcile all of those and so that they're able to be used and recognized by electronic software is really problematic. So the data dictionary hopefully will solve some of that. 
well, and of course, it's getting even more critical as um, we oops as we go into um, uh, BIM and it's attaching information into the into the objects. Oops, I misspelled yep. syntax here. I left the T out. I thought for sure I put that in last night. Oh uh, well, Karen Wood reminds you weren't looking. Uh, oh, okay. Karen Wood requires me that reminds me that I am hoist on my own petard because I didn't proofread it. <laughs> You're absolutely right, Karen. I am highly chagrined. I am mortified. But here's a you know a few goofy things. I, I actually have um, Arcom, bless their hearts. Uh, we'll never use. One word, if two words, will do. And so uh, I have a macro that changes their page format to our office standard. And one of the things is that it it goes through and changes all prior twos to the word before, and it changes in lieu of to instead of, which means exactly the same thing. Um, right. And you find it on notes all the time. Um, why people feel compelled to mention that aluminum storefront is pre-finished. Of course, I'm a bit of a stickler on the pre-finished. To me, that's raw aluminum that ain't been anodized or painted yet. Of course, I'm the kind of guy that thinks that precast concrete is the gray, soupy stuff in the truck. But that's not a, a battle I'm going to win. You may be all alone on the precast concrete argument. Could be. Well, that uh, about wraps it up for this afternoon, and, and uh, hope we gave you some some uh, some interesting uh, things to think about and some uh, funny examples to look at. And just remember the, the how we started the uh, session, and I I'm hoping that Lewis explained the Goldwyn Goldsmith. You know, it's it's you folks here on wine with us that are serious about trying to make things better and and yeah. honestly I would I applaud all of you that we appreciate uh, so much taking the time and effort and exactly in joining that. us here and hopefully doing what we can to make this industry better um, I had a couple of last comments. Uh, Joel Nemi says, uh, and then there are the contractors who put gypsum wallboard on the ceilings instead of just gypsum board. And actually, there is specific <laughs> gypsum ceiling board these days. And Larry Whitlock uh, said, asked the question, is there a difference in the legal meaning of the words comply and conform? I don't know. I guess that would mean a trip to Black Flaw Dictionary, wouldn't it? Yeah. Um, I have one that I inherited from uh, the uh, Jerry Durham that I worked with in my previous office who retired, and he said, I ain't going to use this anymore, and uh, left it with me, but I think it's at home somewhere, so we'll have to look that up. Um, okay, so there. That's your assignment for next month. <laughs> You're going to have to report on it since my you have the dictionary. Item. Okay. Well, listen, um, again, David and I have been talking about next month, talking about specifications uh, then and, and now, and going through a little history. Uh, I actually have a set of specifications that were written in the 1880s for the Cincinnati Art Museum, written in longhand on legal-sized paper. Um, and uh, Was that your share? project? <laughs> Even I'm not that old, David. And, and uh, we're going to look at some, um, we have, both of us have some textbooks from the 40s and 50s and 60s on how to write specifications, and, and we'll look at some of the differences, and we'll talk a little bit about um, uh, CSI and how it came about and, and where it came from and, and so forth, and we hope that that'll be a, a lot of fun and maybe informative, too, and, and uh, helpful. So we'll look forward to seeing you in April.